It's great to see everyone this morning. So good to be here in worshiping our God. I want to invite you to take your Bibles out and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. As we begin our study this morning, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that we're going to be continuing in our, our very brief study of the Holy Spirit. And let me just go ahead and, and, and say this. I have, I have really enjoyed my study with this, but even as I've studied it, I've come to realize that my preparation is insufficient because there is really so much, something we've tended to, at least in my experience in the places that I've been and grown up, We've tended to neglect the Holy Spirit as if there's not much about the Holy Spirit. The opposite's actually true, that there is quite a bit on the Holy Spirit. There's much to be learned and much to be appreciated uh, and much to be applied from this study. And though our studies together on this topic have really only touched the hem of the garment, I do actually hope in the near future uh, to revisit some of these things and do these things a little bit more deeper as after I'm even studying those things more myself. But I want to start with you in Romans chapter 8. I just want to ask this question. When the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, what does that mean? There are a lot of false perceptions, about false ideas about what that means. And some of them are actually conclusions that I think are quite easy to come to in scriptures. You have to really study and you really have to seek, though, to understand. And when you do that, you find that sometimes the surface level reading of a particular passage is not really the interpretation that harmonizes with Scripture. It means what it says, but sometimes you have to look within the greater context, and Romans chapter 8 is going to be one of those passages, to really understand and unpack what a statement uh, or what a single sentence is actually talking about when it's given to us. But let's just start here. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit dwells in us, Okay. I mean, it's very clear, as a matter of fact, to deny the principle is to deny the whole, the whole of the Bible. Let me just show you this. In Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, the language is explicit. The question is not going to be in our study this morning, does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? The question is more going to be, how does the Holy Spirit dwell in you? And the reason the first question is not the question, does the Holy Spirit dwell in you, is because of passages like this. In Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. It seems to be pretty clear from this passage, doesn't it? Now, something that's interesting about this passage, worthy of note, we'll come back to a little bit later, is it uses the indwelling of the Spirit in a kind of a synonymous way with something else in this passage, doesn't it? It goes from, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, down to the end of verse 11, through His Spirit who dwells in you, look at verse 10. If Christ is in you. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's almost using those things as if they're quite synonymous or or parallel thoughts. But but let's just establish the the, the foundation this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is another passage that's quite similar to this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, a passage where the context is Paul writing to the Corinthians and reminding them not to be involved in sexual immorality because basically it defies the holiness of of the nature of the life of one who is a child of God, he says this in verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Okay? The Holy Spirit within you, the language is very clear, the language is very simple, there's really no question as to does the Spirit dwell. The question is going to be different as we consider it a little in in just a few moments. But let's consider another one, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, as Paul is writing to Timothy, follow the pattern of sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good, deposit, entrusted, 
to you. Is there any question that the Holy Spirit dwells in us? No, none whatsoever, okay? The Bible is very clear that there, I mean, we, we don't like using the phrase because of, because of what we know is false teaching connected to it, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a biblical concept. It is a biblical concept. The question just becomes understanding what does that mean. I think the Bible gives us some clues as to what that means, though I, I, I don't uh, dare to say that he gives us everything, only that he gives us that which he expects us to know. There are going to be even some things that he tells us the Holy Spirit does as a product of his indwelling Christians that I don't understand how it happens. For instance, in Romans chapter 8, how the Spirit intercedes for us in our prayers when we don't know what to pray for. Does the Spirit do that? Yes, the Bible says that. Is there any way you can get around that? No. Do I understand exactly how it happens? I don't. But I can rest in confidence that he does. And I'm thankful for that. All of these passages tell us that the Holy Spirit dwells inside of Christians, but none of the passages tell you how. And there are certainly different views on how and what that means. But I want to just focus predominantly this morning on what does it mean, not so much what does it not mean. That's one of the things I've kind of gotten frustrated with in my studies, listening to sermons. There's a lot of emphasis on what it doesn't mean, which I'm going to deal with in about 30 seconds. Because I think the emphasis of the Holy Spirit is for us to understand the benefit of what the Holy Spirit does for us, not to let all of our conversations be dominated by who he's not, but by who he is. Number one, the Spirit is oftentimes perceived to be this mystical force. And that was the reason for our first study. The Holy Spirit is a person. By the definition of personhood. A person doesn't mean human. Person means person. You can go look that definition up. And you can remember what we talked about in connection with that. He has at, his attributes and his characteristics and his qualities. And he's one of purpose. The Bible presents him to us that way. But what happens a lot of times with the Holy Spirit is that people say, well, well the Holy Spirit is, is, is a... Is a revealing force within me, and he tells me things, or he leads me in certain directions. And, 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 and here's where that goes, the loose interpretation of what, it, of what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit means. I've told you before about some friends that we have, and they worship at a congregation that has the same description on the sign that ours does. And um, they, they have gotten to the point where a lot of things have been permitted within the context of their assembly that clear defiance of Scripture. And how, here's how they justify it. Here's how they justify it. So for instance, conversations about instrumental music or conversations about women in leadership roles or whatever the conversation happens to be. Here's the justification for it. Our elders got up in the pulpit and told us that this was going to be a change that we were going to make. They would not have been permitted to say what they said or decide what they decided unless the Holy Spirit permitted them to do it. You see, that's the danger we get into, is we take a, a loose interpretation of the Spirit and start attributing to the Holy Spirit things that the Holy Spirit never attributes to Himself in the revealed Word and take it as this personal leading where whatever I think or whatever I feel, it must be the Holy Spirit speaking to me, and because the Holy Spirit speaking to me, it must be right, it must be true, it must be good. That's just not the case. As a matter of fact, to, to come into that realm is to deny the inspiration and the authenticity of the Holy Word of God. That God confirmed, that God revealed, that God confirmed, and that God preserved. And so many people think of the Holy Spirit as an inner driver that tells them what they need to know, leads them in the way He wants them to go, which I can agree if, with, if understood properly, but that's not the way that it's often understood. What is the Holy Spirit not? The Holy Spirit is not someone who is ever going to tell me anything contrary to what he's already told me in the completed Word of God. But I want to draw your attention to something, and this is kind of interesting. The conversations about the Holy Spirit, we kind of get enamored with this, and I've become enamored with this. I've become, 
I, I've become very excited in my studies about this, especially in passages like uh, one day I was just sitting down and just reading 2 Corinthians, and I was reading uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, and wow, it was just incredible. And all the things that are spoken about the Spirit, all the things it does, the Spirit does in the life of the believer, it's just incredible. And I've come to love this study, and I'm excited about continuing it. But, but we get so enthusiastic about it. There's something that we overlook, and I think it's an important thing to consider. And it's that the Holy Spirit is not the only one who's said to dwell in us. The Holy Spirit's not the only one who's said to dwell in us, but he's the only one that we often talk about as being the one who dwells in us. I want to show you something just very quickly. Here's our passage, or just a short excerpt from Romans 8, 9 through 11, which we just looked at. Let's look at 1 John 4, 12 through 15 for just a second. In 1 John chapter 4, in verses 12 through 15, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world and whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. God abides in him and he in God. This passage it seems to be talking about really the Father being in us. I know you could say God abides in us, representation of that in us is the Spirit. But it's interesting that verse 13, speaking of God, says He has given us His Spirit, speaking to the distinction between the three of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not only is the Spirit dwelling in us, Romans 8, 9 through 11, but now we have the promise that God abides in us, 1 John 4, 12 through 15. That's interesting to me. What about Ephesians chapter 3? In Ephesians chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, what does this passage have to say in connection? That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that, this is interesting, isn't it? Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That through faith part's important. We'll come back to that a little bit later. With power through his Holy, Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart. So here's something that's sometimes overlooked, but I think it makes a powerful point. When it comes to the life of a Christian, there is not just this promise that the Holy Spirit is in you, but there is a promise that the Father and the Son is in you, that God abides in you, and reversing that, that we abide in God if we are walking in His ways. There is, this, there, there, there is certainly the promise throughout Scripture that the Holy Spirit was within us, but it's not a promise that's unique to Him. It's a promise that is universal amongst those who make up the Godhead. If you are a believer, then the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in you. The text is just clear. I want to look at a couple more passages. I didn't put them up on the screen, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 5, just reemphasize that last point about Jesus being in us. I just want to turn to them pretty quickly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 5, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless, indeed, you fail to meet the text. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1. And in verse 27, Colossians 1 and verse 27. To them God chose to make known is how great among the Gentiles are the riches of his glory in this mystery, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit is in you, the Father is in you, the Son is in you. Well, the question again is going to be how? What does that mean? Is he like literally inside of me somewhere occupying a physical place in my life? Biblical language does not support that. When you look at all these passages amongst all the other ones that we don't really have time to get to, what you see in this text is what's being emphasized is fellowship with God. That's what these passages are about, fellowship with God. Now, does that have very personal implications? Absolutely, and we're going to talk about those. 
Okay, we're not, we're not dismissing the personal, physical indwelling to, to distance ourselves from the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen. When you look, think about it from a biblical perspective, it doesn't make him further away. It just understands him as he, is, as he has revealed himself to us, and it understands him as he has made himself known. And by knowing him as he is known, we come closer and closer all the time. By our understanding of who he is and what this fellowship means and and how it translates in the life of a believer, we are drawn closer to him, not further away, just because it doesn't fit the language that we like to use. Though let me just say this. I understand how people get there by reading these passages at face value and not expanding it out and thinking about what the whole of Scripture has to say. I understand how they get there. But when we understand that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all said to be in the believer and to abide with the believer and to walk in fellowship with the believer and what that means throughout Scripture, I believe we come to understand that this is language that is being used to highlight fellowship, just as Paul writes to Christians and says, you are in me and I am in you. Literally? No. But he's highlighting the fellowship and the bond that they have through Jesus Christ. The idea of indwelling stresses spiritual fellowship. And all of this is enabled by what we began with, or the second lesson we talked about in Acts chapter 2, in verse 38 and 39, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, it is... The Holy Spirit, we studied that through the Old Testament. How do they understand that? What do they understand that to mean? Well, it's the breath or the life of God. It is life that is breathed into to, um, fleshless bones. It is those who are lost and who are dead in the trespasses and sins, and they are overcome by, by all that has encapsulated them through their life of sin. And God, through His Spirit, He comes and He breathes life into what was lifeless. And because life is breathed in, fellowship is obtained, and now we walk with God. Not because of anything we've done or earned, but because we've yielded ourselves to Him, and by faith, He has breathed life into our dead souls. Well, how does that translate practically? Well, I'm going to just suggest four things to you that that just pop out clearly to me from Scripture, and I hope this is encouraging to you. It's incredibly encouraging to me, um, just, uh, again, just doing this study. Number one, it's the promise of His presence. The fact that we have been granted life, that we have been given the Holy Spirit, and that the constant reassurance is given throughout the course of Scripture that we have the Holy Spirit What's actually happening through the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, through these inspired writers, is the Holy Spirit is continually reminding us, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's like that psalm where every other line is the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. It's like that clock where every tick is a reminder of a foundational truth that we must remember and never forget The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. He loves me. He's with me. He's being patient with me. He's bringing me where I want to go. He is the great shepherd. The text is continually reminding Christians, I am with you. I'm with you. When I, use, when I think about this language, I think about it really in connection with what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it reminds me of temple language. If you go back to Exodus chapter, 30, uh, Exodus chapter 40 for just a second, I want to just show you something from the temple language. Um, from the idea of the temple as it's, as it's been completed, uh, it has been built, and the glory of the Lord is, is actually about to fill the temple. One of the things that's interesting, just a little side note, if you go and look at any reference to the, to the tent of meeting, the tabernacle or the temple later, and you look at it in Exodus, or you look at it, uh, it references to it in Deuteronomy, or through the prophets, especially Ezekiel, nearly every time the temple is referenced and God being with them, it never says God is in the temple. The glory of the Lord is in the temple. 
And the glory of the Lord, and you'll see it here in this text, the glory of the Lord is manifest by the presence of the cloud. It's just a, a visual reminder, I'm with you. When they see the cloud, when they see it lift and move, they know to go. When they see it settle, they know to plant. When they just see it there, they know he's there. It's a visible representation of the glory of the Lord, the Lord who is omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. The glory of the Lord who does not dwell in temples made with hands. Who is not restricted to the most holy place. But rather has simply put there a sign of his presence. And in verse 34 it says in Exodus 40 in verse 34. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all their journeys whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day. And fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. This was simply a visual reminder for the sake of the people. I'm with you. I'm in your presence. Is the whole of who I am literally there contained within the bounds of that most holy place? No. No. But the cloud is a sign that the glory of the Lord is there. And when you see it, you'll know what to do. You'll know how to act. You'll know where to go. This was simply a sign of God's presence. It was a sign of God's presence. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for just a second. I want to make, uh, I want to, I'll go ahead and confess, I want to make a lot out of something that's just given to you just very simply here in this text, but. It was kind of interesting, it's, it's kind of interesting that wherever Israel go, Israel had a reputation. They had a reputation, I mean we see it with Rahab in the city of Jericho. Here comes Israel and she's, she's begging to be saved, she's begging to, to uh, experience the mercy of God because she has heard about how God goes with these people and nobody can stand before him. She has heard about how God goes with these people. We read about the people The Gibeonites who know that the Israel is coming and they're just wiping out everyone who stands in their path. And so they send representatives to Joshua and say deceptively what needs to be said in order to preserve them. Why? Because Yahweh goes with Israel. He's in their presence. The God that goes with Israel, he's one that can't be defeated. He's one that can't be overcome. And all I'm simply trying to make out of this is simply the fact that The world knew that God was among his people. God gave them success. God was blessing them and no one could stand before them. And the reputation spread quickly. And the world knew that God was among them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I know you're wondering why we went to the passage about prophecy in tongues. Chapters 12 through 14 about some of the miraculous spiritual gifts that are taking place uh, in the church at Corinth, and Paul's giving some instructions on how to use those and when to restrain those and various things that he's talking about. And and we've emphasized before that really the, the beating heart of this whole passage is that all these things are to be used for the service of the church, the building up of the saints, and where that happens, use it. Where it doesn't, stop it. But one of the parts of this passage that's always been intriguing to me And I think it speaks to one of the purposes for which God gives the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about in the second sermon later on this morning. He intends to sanctify when we talked about that. He intends to change and to transform and to completely flip our lives upside down. I think one of the reasons that God gives us the Holy Spirit in the ways that he does is for a purpose of mission and witness. And I just want, let's just look at this passage where it talks about unbelievers coming into the, to the place of worship. Verse 22, tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign for unbelievers, not for unbelievers but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? 
But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God, and here it is, he will declare that God is really among you. I think that's important. I think it's important that the lost world look to Christ's church and to the individuals that make up the church and see the lives that they're living, the words that they're speaking, the thoughts that they're thinking, the, the way in which they're serving, how they deal with the adversities of life, with anxiety and worry and trials and hardship. I think it's so important that the world be able to look at the lives of the Christian and see something so completely bizarre to the way that the rest of the world lives that they have to declare God is among those people. God is among those people. What accounts for the change? What accounts for the different type of living? What accounts for all of these things that we see in here that we don't see in here in the world? Well, it's the fact that we don't have the spirit of the world but we have been given the Spirit of God. How does that come? Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes to the Galatians, and he acknowledges there in that text that the Spirit came to them by the word of faith, the hearing of faith. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, we know that passage, don't we? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And if you look, um, if you Look in Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 17, we understand now how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 17, by the thing that set the people of Hebrews chapter 11 so far apart from all the world around them. Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse 17, what does it say in there in that text? He came and he preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near. See, am I reading the right? Nope, I'm sorry. Verse 17. Ephesians 3, 17. I was reading chapter 2. Let me start in verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Through faith. You know, so many people struggle with feeling or wondering if the Holy Spirit is there because we're thinking about the Holy Spirit wrong. The Holy Spirit is not a felt experience. We know that because of this passage. He says the Holy Spirit is in our heart through faith, but we also know that by all the passages we looked at and so many more that remind Christians, do you not know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that the Holy Spirit is in you? Why? Because it's not a felt experience. It's a promise of his, of his presence that must be believed and embraced, and we must remember always and never forget. There's a reason the New Testament writers keep reminding the people over and over and over and over again, the Holy Spirit is with you, the Holy Spirit is in you, Christ is in you, the Father is in you, God abides in you, and you abide in God. It's because it's not a felt experience, and when we measure ourselves by felt experiences that are not, that are not standards given to us in Scriptures, then we're going to come up hopeless feeling as though we're not children of God at all, or we're just missing something completely that somebody else over here seems to have. Well, that might not necessarily be true. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit in you. Maybe you're a little bit more immature than someone because you've not put things into practice, and you've not been, what we're going to talk about later, walking by the Spirit or filling yourself up with the Spirit. But those are two different conversations. The assurance of God is that if you are a believer and that if you have come to Him in faith, then you have the presence of God with you. I want you to turn to, so you're in Ephesians. I want you to look there uh, in chapter 5 for just a second. 
So look at, so put your finger in uh, chapter 5, and then I want you to turn and look at Colossians chapter 3. So, sorry, I feel like, I feel like I'm confused in my mind, so you're confused, I know that, because I've been going different places. We're still talking about the promise of his presence. Where does the promise come from? The promise is not a felt experience. The promise is given to you by the Holy Spirit, through the inspired writers. By faith, we believe the words to be true, and by faith, we believe that he is with us. So by the Holy Spirit, we have the promise that God is with us. Through the indwelling of the Spirit, we have the promise of his presence. In Colossians chapter 3, I mean, Ephesians chapter 5, we have this passage that we'll study a little bit later in verse 18. Do not be drunk with wine, for it's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I'm not going to keep reading. We'll come back to it. But verse 18 says, be filled with the Spirit. If you've read Ephesians and Colossians together before, you know that they are pretty much parallel books. They deal with a lot of the same stuff, and oftentimes they deal with them in the same order. And if you look over at Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, there's going to be a little bit of clarity given here to be filled with the Spirit as Paul, writing to the Colossians, completely leaves that part out and changes the wording of it and describes it in a completely different way. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, the counterpart to Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, instead of be filled with the Spirit, what does it say there? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Take the word of God into your heart and let it live there. It's interesting, he uses that synonymous with what he says to the Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit. That shouldn't confuse us or or be difficult to understand even in just consideration of Ephesians 5 Because in Ephesians chapter 5, he tells us how to be filled with the Spirit. And all of those things have to do with the Word of God, right? We're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're reminding ourselves of spiritual truths. And again, we'll come back to that later. But the idea is the same. The promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is that we might have the promise of His presence always with us. And that promise is reiterated and we are reminded of it over and over and over again through the Word of God. It's not a felt experience. It is the promise of His adoption and it is the promise of His presence for the purpose of sanctification and salvation. There's another though, his, the, the responsibility of holiness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, what is the Holy what is the, in, the, the the dwell indwelling of the Holy Spirit mean for us? Number one, it means the promise of His presence. But that's something that we have to commit our minds to. It's something we can forget. It's something we can lose connection with. But as we come into the Word of God, we find the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Every time we open the pages, these are the product of, of, of His words, reassuring us that He is with us. Number two, from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we understand that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is God's calling us to the responsibility of holiness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm not going to stay here for very long, um, but um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, talking about sexual immorality and how the Christian is to flee from sexual immorality, verse 18, he says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What that means is what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and says, You're a vessel. God has made me a vessel. And by giving me life through the Holy Spirit, He has regenerated me, He has renewed me, He has washed me, and He has taken a dishonorable vessel, and He has made me into a vessel for honorable Use. And so everything that I have, the members of my body, my thoughts, my words, my actions, everything, everything about who I am is to be dedicated for a holy purpose. And to give myself to, th- myself to things that defy the nature of God and the nature of who He has made me through His Holy Spirit. As He's breathed life into my soul and He has set me apart as holy for Him is to defy the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is to undermine the fact that he bought me with a price, that I belong to him, and that I have been called for a purpose that is completely holy. The third thing is the power of of influence. 
And I, again, we're going to talk more about this in the second sermon a little bit later on, but 1 Corinthians 6 is a good passage to consider in connection with that as well. The reminder, we are not our own. We live in accordance. We are to live in accordance with who we are. As a matter of fact, it's interesting in other texts, that's similar to what we talked about earlier, even in Romans chapter 8, where it uses the phrase, the Spirit of Christ, synonymous with the Spirit living in us and Christ living in us. 1 Corinthians 6 does the same thing. We look there in verse 19. You, do you not know that the Holy Spirit is, with, is, is in you? The body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. If you look up in verse 15, what does he say? Your body is a member of Christ. And he uses those two ideas in con- conjunction with one another. Uh, my body is a vessel for Christ. My body is a vessel for the Holy Spirit. And I'm to be used in an honorable way, in a way that, that, that doesn't undermine the holy nature, but conforms to the holy nature. The idea is that because of who we are and the fellowship that we have with him, we are to be given to holy purposes, to be influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit as he reveals himself to us through his word. Um, There is a repetition. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what I need to cut out. Um, There is a repetition of different phrases that are used in conjunction, conjunction with this throughout the New Testament that remind us of the fact that the Holy Spirit's indwelling is meant to influence, to give us power for influence. Some of those phrases are this, and again, we'll look at these later. Walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, live by the Spirit. All of these things simply stress the idea or the purpose of the Holy Spirit to sanctify a people for himself. Um, for the ultimate purpose of salvation is not only has he called us to life, has he given us life, but he's called us to cultivate life and to live in harmony with the the way of life that he's given to us. Um, All right, let's just go ahead and just cut to this last one just very, very quickly. And if we need to come back and do anything else, we we, we can do that at a later time. But I'm going to give this and and, and I'm going to just point to a couple of things. And and I'm going to give the qualifier because because you have to in this day, in, in this time. But, but one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is not just the promise of God's presence, the responsibility of holiness, the power of his influence. But one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit is, is that you and I can be assured that, here's the qualifier, if we are people of faith, and if we are walking by faith, we have the assurance of salvation. That language is everywhere. Romans chapter 8 is one of, the, one of the places, if you look there in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> in Romans chapter 8, and, and we've talked about this in different contexts before of you know, walking in the light or, or whatever, whatever ways we, we, we want to talk about this. There is the qualifier that even in Romans chapter 8 that, that God is, is working for good um, in all circumstances, verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. The qualifier is even there in that text, right? It's for those who love God. It's for those who love God. But, but again, here's one, of those, here's one of those places where I feel like sometimes, at least in my growing up, we would prefer to talk about the negative than we would to talk about the positive. And now, from this point, we would go off and talk about falling from grace and how every person is in danger of hell and stuff like that. We need to have those conversations. God, God is a God of justice and God is a God of wrath. But can we just stop for a moment and appreciate the power of what he's telling us? Can we just stop for a moment and appreciate how grand and magnificent of a thought this is? Look there in verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and in verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Okay, let me stop for just a second. You have the promise of his presence. If you're a person of faith, if you have have been converted, if you have obeyed the gospel. A little bit later on, if you look there in verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I think the idea there is simply this. How does our spirit bear witness with his spirit? The spirit tells us the things that must happen in order for us to have confidence in our salvation. Okay? Why did, how does my spirit bear witness with his spirit? I measure myself up against what the spirit says. The spirit says this is how you have salvation. I look at what he says. I look at my life. That's what I've done. 
The Spirit bears witness with my spirit now. I'm a child of God. And it rests on faith. It, faith, it rests on belief that what God says is true. We can have confidence that we are God's children. In verse 11, if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if you have answered the call of Christ and you are walking in the way of faith, and that is you, Here's the promise. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. What is He saying there? That because you have the Spirit of life in you, when you die, that's not the end. Because just as the Spirit raised Christ from the dead, He's going to raise you from the dead. It all goes back to what the Spirit is for us. What is the Spirit? It's the breath of life. And as long as the Spirit of life is in you, there is nothing that can separate you from the living God, which he goes about on to talk about in the end of Romans chapter 8. Of course, the qualifier of that being continuing in the way of loving God. And I actually want to show you just a little bit. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 30. I'm not going to read all of this, but notice what he's doing. I just want you to notice what he's doing. He's trying to instill confidence in the people who, 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 who are the people of the Spirit, who are the people of God. He's trying to give them confidence. In verses 18 through the end, he says, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed. Verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And he goes on to talk about how he's perfecting us under the image of, of his Son. Verse 31, the conclusion of this is this. What then shall we say after all these things? If God is for us... Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave, gave up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Verse 37, the answer, I'm just going to skip that. Verse 37, the answer that he comes back to is no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will we be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Can I throw away my faith and thereby quench the Spirit? Absolutely. But that's not the conversation he's having here. The conversation he's having here really is encapsulated by what he says in Romans chapter 15 and in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That's the purpose of the indwelling right there. What does it mean that we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit? We have the promise of His presence always, the responsibility towards holiness, the power of His influence, and provided we remain faithful, the assurance of salvation, a gift that nothing beyond ourselves in this world can take away from us. Because we have life. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope. We'll come back to this conversation a little bit later on. I apologize for the extra minutes that I took. And we'll take a short break now and then we'll have our Bible classes.